The Central Bank of Nigeria's Monetary Policy Committee has raised interest rates by 50 basis points from 26.25% to 26.75%. CBN Governor Olayemi Kadoso made the announcement in Abuja after the conclusion of the 296th MPC meeting. Additionally, the MPC set the cash reserve ratio for commercial banks at 14%, and for deposit money banks at 50 at 45 percent. Decisions of the MPC. The committee's decisions are as follows. One, raise the MPR by 50 basis points to 260 to 27.65% from 26.25%. Adjusted the asymmet asymmetric corridor around the MPR from plus 100 to minus 300 to plus 500 to minus 100 basic this points. Retain the cash reserve ratio of deposit money banks at 45% and merchant banks at 14%. Retain the liquidity ratio at 30%. Uh, joining us now on this show to discuss the Monetary Policy Committee meeting and the interest rate is Aditi Lewa Adebajo, Chief Executive Officer of the CFG Advisory. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Well, very quickly. Well, the uh, World Bank, IMF, they have been praising uh, the monetary authorities in Nigeria for tightening, you know, monetary uh, policy. But we have seen again under Caduso the same orthodox approach. You know, uh, they keep tightening monetary policy. Inflation is already. Uh, over 34%, 34.19%. Mm. And now we have interest rate at 26.75% uh, in July. Mm. Well, the explanation that some people have given is that CBN has uh, no option because the fiscal side is asleep. Even if they said they've introduced some measures about food imports and all of that. Now, what's your assessment of this orthodox policy continuous tightening? They will tighten uh, this economy so, uh, to such an extent that we will not be able to breathe again. Then what do you think? Well, thank you very much, Ruben. Um, good morning, Ayo. Good morning. Well, it's been a while. Yes, yes. And good of course, Rufai. Ogabisa. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm waiting for your questions. Ogabisa. Well, in order to answer your question, I think one of the biggest challenges we have in Nigeria today is stagflation. And stagflation is a very difficult situation to get out of. High unemployment, high inflation, and low growth. And as long as the economy is experiencing uh, runaway inflation, the economy cannot grow. And inflation erodes all our purchasing power. Um, while I agree with you that there are some challenges on the fiscal side which we will address, uh, it is important that we should stem inflation. And let us go back and take a look at the historical um, issues. Um, so let's look at the facts and figures. In 2011 and 2014, Nigerian economy grew by over 8.5%. Why? Inflation was between 9 and uh, 11%, and interest rates were between 12 and 13%. So for the advocates of low interest rates, I think it's also important to understand, yes, low interest rates are desirable for growth, but interest rates and inflation have to be lower at the same time. Uh, and more importantly, um, the rate of inflation must, cannot erode interest rates, otherwise you have negative real rates, which is what we're experiencing under stagflation in Nigeria. So in order for us to provide the platform or the template to grow, the most important thing is to be able to control inflation. Hence, you can see why the CBN is looking at that. So I think it's now beginning time to start looking at the voting patterns of most of the MPC members, which is what I've analyzed. 
the governor himself is very hawkish on rates. Um, you know, so is Aku, uh, Bamidele, and Mustafa. Those people on the MPC are very hawkish on increasing rates. But you have peop other people like uh, Yugoda, Isa, and um, who are more, uh, they are not as hawkish in terms of looking at rates, and then you have the rest in the middle. So, and I think that outcry of saying that, okay, interest rates are too high, I would have expected a 100 basis point increase in rates for now, uh, because inflation increase is now marginal. Um, I would have expected a 100 basis point, but obviously because of the complaints and of course the members of the MPC are saying that, look, people are there. That's why it's a committee, because everybody has different voting patterns. So I think the emphasis was to be able to have a marginal increase in, uh, in rates, and eventually this is going to take time. So we shouldn't expect anything until this time next year to begin to moderate inflation. So the, the CBN has targeted inflation, saying they want to take it to like 21 to 24 percent by the end of the year. And then hopefully by this time next year, we can begin to see it coming down to uh, 15 percent and things like that. So it's a question of time. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And the reason why is because, you know, we've talked about ways and means. The 30 trillion ways and means that we've been talking about here, this is the impact you are seeing on the economy. And that is why it's, you know, it's going to take a bit of time to, um, to get things to 30 trillion ways and means. Yes. Will be described as uh, Wari's legacy? Do 7 trillion out of it is part of this, uh, Yes, so between them. <laughs> <laughs> APC legacy. Well, yeah, something yeah. like that, APC yes. Legacy. Okay, so I'm glad you talk about stagflation. Yes. And I can't, 100 basis points is what you'd have, you, did you say that's what you'd have recommended? Yes. Or you, okay, yes. so then what will happen to small businesses and the high interest rates? Especially because, like you mentioned, we haven't seen quite enough on the fiscal side of things. So at least help to, um, um, to balance or cushion the effect on these, on small businesses. Let's speak up for the small businesses. Lending rates is at an all-time high. Yes, you're, we can see I mean, to an extent, the impact of the increase in the, you know, the, NPR, the MPC um, decisions and NPR rates over time and see, um, like you mentioned, marginal increase in, in, in inflation, but it's still stifling small businesses. And if they continue to increase it, then what's, what's the option for them already? Lending was a, big, was a big challenge for a number of small businesses. I see you smiling because I'm here to speak for the small businesses. I know we want to tame inflation. And you talk about the numbers for next year. I'm even doubtful of that because if we don't have commensurate um, fiscal policy aligning with monetary policy, then we might not even see the, you know, the impact that you've talked about. Okay, thank you very much, Ayo. I know you're quite compassionate in that area. But let us take a look at the flip side, okay? The pensioners are not complaining because they're getting nice returns on their savings. So with everything, there's always a flip side to it. The people who are saving, who are investing, are enjoying a nice time now because they keep their money in the bank and they're getting nice interest rates. They're, they're being quoted by banks. People are looking for deposits. Uh, pension fund uh, assets are growing. Uh, pensions are now at 20 trillion. And, you know, they're, they're experiencing the boom with the rise in all the interest rates of all the various assets they're investing in. So with everything, there's always a flip side to it. So the question always is to always find that middle ground, which is what I told you, that in 2011 and 2014, when the economy was growing at 8 to 5 percent, inflation was between 9 and 11 percent, and interest rates were between 12 and 13 percent. That's NPR. So the optimal level where we need to be is low inflation and low interest rates. So, but unfortunately, because of the ways and means party we had, uh, the hangover is now what we are dealing with. So that is really where, so the, the economy goes into what we'll call disequilibrium. So the whole challenge of the central bank now is that they need to restore that equilibrium back to the optimal where interest rates are low and also um, inflation rates are also low. So that is really where it is. We're in disequilibrium as a result of uh, ways and means. And right now, um, uh, our monetary supply, money supply in our economy has exceeded 100 trillion naira. It grew by almost 60 trillion in the last one year. So that is a significant amount of money coming into money supply. 
But let me tell you about the small businesses, which is something I've always had a concern about also. Um, small businesses in the informal sector contribute to 50% of our GDP. And I think it's not something that we need to take lightly. However, there is 3.7 trillion Naira of cash outside the banking system, outside the control of the central bank that drives that economy in this country. Now, this 3.7 trillion is money that the central bank does not have control over and is not in the vaults of banks. And that is the money that funds the informal sector. I would have liked, you know, once we can tame inflation, to be able to increase this money to about 5 trillion. Because you see, most of the SMEs do not use banks. If you take a look at the bank portfolio, it's an 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of their loans go to the biggest 20 of the, to the 20% biggest principle. company. The Pareto principle applies in that area. So but Nigerian banks don't fund SMEs. That's the reality. Uh, SMEs, their main source of financing is informal. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of things. I'm happy you touched on those areas. Mm. The first thing is, can we really say the inflation was about the ways and means? Because we had the maze and maze on our books before that inflation of over 11% jump happened that President Tinubu cost. He takes the responsibility for that. Pulling out of the subsidy was also an inflation trigger. Mm. Secondly, you talked about the 100 million money circulation. I'm very happy about that, that you talked about it. Because when the solution was provided with the Naya redesign policy, mm. these same politicians went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court had to rule about a monetary policy issue by saying, no, spend other currency. We did Paris Pursue. So it is still their fault that we are in this quagmire we are today. The third point I ever want to raise is, I know the book, the textbook convention, you economists will say, oh, once inflation is high, you raise interest rates. Must we always... Can't we do like the central bank in America where they look at data? What are the data inflation drivers here, which is more or less the fiscal side? I think, let me answer the last question quickly. We, all, we know what is driving inflation, and I think we've said it, that it's 30 trillion ways and means. There's a direct correlation between that. Um, I so think also is the hundred, uh, over 100 trillion money. And yes, inflation. because don't forget that, so that the, the, the ways and means was oh, kept on the books of central bank. They didn't release it to debt management office. So, you know, we're still dealing with that issue yeah. of the illegal securitization of the ways and And how much is it? I hear the Senate is also speaking. They are saying they are trying to investigate the real amount. So and is no, it really no, the 33? How much is it really? I think that one, the reconcil don't forget, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, some has been paid and interest is also coming mm. on top of it. So it's a, it's a revolving facility. So things are moving. It's not mm. static. Mm. So the numbers change regularly. But what I'm trying to say is very simply that um, that recognition of 30 trillion of ways and means plus the additional spending is what has triggered money supply to um, 100 million, 100 trillion, trillion yeah. naira. So we didn't recognize that before because they kept it on the books of the central bank. So now that has been recognized. So I think that's what's important. So for me, I think what is important is, first of all, let us know the position of the debt. So that's very important. Talk about orthodoxy in terms of inflation. As I've said, inflation, even this, the, uh, the Reserve Bank of America you've talked about, is data-driven. Like I've told you before, if you look at the historical data of Nigeria, it's the same thing. Look at 2011, look at 2014. Uh, inflation between 9 and 11 percent growth, GDP growths of in excess of 8 percent. So it's the same thing if you look at the historical data. Then we've had a CBN target of 9% inflation. Yes, but the challenge that we're seeing from the charts in the thing is debt service, which is what we'll get to. If you take a look at the charts on the screen now, you see that the, uh, the debt service and debt repayment is about $8 trillion from the budget this year, and the budget for education and defense is just over $2 trillion. So um, we're using over four times our defense budget and education budget to, uh, to service debt. That is some of the challenges that we need to address. But in terms of inflation, you cannot, without, without taming inflation, we're not going to go anywhere. And the okay. problem we had, like you said, is that when, when the new government came in, 
the announced subsidy and foreign exchange without a finance minister and a central bank governor being in place. The fin finance minister did not come in place until August, and the central bank governor did not come in place until September. We didn't raise interest rates from July last year until the first MPC, maybe like February, March this year. So within that nine-month window, when we're supposed to have tightened... Mr. Shodubi will not be happy with you that you said there was no central bank governor. Okay, I'm no, no, sorry. Maybe I was Mr. Shodubi will okay, not be happy with you. Okay, my apologies. Well, there, was an acting, <laughs> there was an acting, there was an acting well, governor. Mr. So. Nenikis, we've had four MPCs yes. this year. Three of the meetings we've raised by... Uh, in three meetings, we raised by 750 basis points. Yes, adjustments. Ah, uh, yes. Well, and, and then we have not seen any positive effect. Food inflation is going up. Yes. Everything is going up. Mm. Two questions, quickly. One, this uh, food inflation, they've tried to uh, advertise or announce. They've not, I, I assume that they've not finalized their plan. What they call Tinubu's uh, food plan. Mm. What do you think of that food plan? as proposed. This is the second week. The Minister of Agri said they will give us the details. We're still waiting for the details. But that's already announced. What do you think of it? Will it help inflation? And the second point, the same subject we've been discussing all this while, even today, the uh, forore, the controversy over Dangote refinery <laughs> and the implications <laughs> for economic stability and investment in Nigeria. Those two things. Okay. Let us finish the economic side of things, which is talk about the food policy here. Uh, yeah, food, okay, yes. apart, food policy yeah. is the economy. Yeah. Dangote refinery is also the economy. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. We'll come to that because that's a trending topic in Nigeria. Yes. So, uh, I just uh, wanted your views. Definitely, definitely. Um, well, um, food. Like I said, I think it's a good idea uh, because what they're trying to do is on the short term uh, tackle food inflation head on. Um, and I think it's also important to understand that um, if you take a look at the trajectory on month on month inflation, it's actually coming down. So it's just that we've seen a marginal increase in the last month. So what I see is that we need to start focusing on core inflation. That is to remove energy prices and food prices from inflation to be able to understand what we're looking at in terms of core inflation. But to answer your point, question, in terms of the policy for the food, I think it's a, it's a good interventionist idea. It's not a permanent solution. But what I'm concerned about is that it mustn't be abused. Because if you abuse it, then we will not get the, the benefits. And that is always the challenge in Nigeria. You come up with a good policy, and then you screw it up when it comes to the implementation. So that is my concern on that. So, um, that's good. So now you want to talk about the Dangote refinery. Now, tell me, what exactly is the issue with the Dangote refinery? I'm trying to understand what, 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 I, what, what, what exactly, I've been asking a lot of people, what exactly is the problem? And I'll give you my own views. You don't know what the issues are? I don't know. You've what not the been issue. reading newspapers? I've been reading newspapers. Uh -huh. You did not hear all the things that uh, Farouk Ahmed has been saying. Okay. Yeah, those are the issues. Okay, so <laughs> Farouk Ahmed and Meli Kari went to their board and then got an approval to invest in Dangote Refinery. Is that not so? So when they got the approval to, did they not do their due diligence to understand what sort of uh, refinery he was building? And now you come back and say that, uh, well, there's this and there's that, there's this and that. No. So I, I want us to stick with the facts. Okay, and I don't want us to, um, to stray. Yes, um, and also, it's also important that I, I also make a disclaimer. I visited that refinery about three times, twice on a private visit, and then the third one about two Sundays ago where uh, they invited a few um, editors to come in to see what were, was going on there. And it's quite an impressive site. And I think I wrote an, a small article about the facts and figures of the refinery. So the question for me is that somebody has invested $20 billion in that refinery. And let, let, us, let me just make a statement now very carefully. Nigeria's government's revenue from this year's budget is about 15 trillion naira, which is about $10 billion. $10 billion yeah. Dangote Refinery and Dangote Group next year are going to do revenues of close to $30, 30, billion, 30, billion, 30 billion dollars. dollars. Yeah. So Dangote Group is already making three times the revenue of the federal government. So it's already a huge conglomerate that is all over Africa. 
and you know it's on its way. So we have two choices because you know the, the refinery itself, you know Nigeria's consumption is just only four hundred thousand barrels a day, and his refinery is six fifty thousand barrels a day. So he can decide to import all his crude and export all his products. He's been exporting urea for three years already. Anyway, he's been exporting aviation fuel. He's been exporting diesel. So if we do not want the refinery, then he will just begin to export to other countries. But having said that, I think if somebody makes a $20 billion investment, I think what is important is that we need to look at our energy security. My, my biggest challenge is the fact that for the last 25 years in this country, we have been importing petroleum products. Yeah. And we have four maribound refineries that's not been working. So the NMPC has a case to answer in that area that 25 years you've not been able to fix four refineries and you've not and been, they've been able collecting to salaries and they've been spending money on them. Exactly. And mm -hmm. to make matters worse, in the last 14 years, we have spent 27 trillion on subsidies and close to 35 trillion on fuel importation. So it's a travesty. So that's why I say that there is no argument in this situation because we have a we have a, an industry or a project that can resolve a significant problem we have in Nigeria today. So, like I've said, if there's a conflict, let's resolve it. You know, let everybody come. The president is the minister of petroleum. So he puts him in a challenging position and all these issues. The government is going to spend $5 trillion on subsidies this year. No, they denied that. They no, didn't no, no, I'm not, I'm not, That's I'm not, what I'm not, they, they are not going into that. But what I'm saying <laughs> is the fact that let us understand that there is a subsidy. The fuel on the NMPC stations is 568. The landed cost of products is 1,117. Yeah. So we have a challenge in this country. I believe this project can resolve a lot of issues. So what I'm saying is that there is no discussion here. What you need to do is sit down on a table and resolve the issues. Uh, you know, because otherwise, the problems we have in this country with, if, imagine if we had stable supply and when, so gov, you've seen those charts. The biggest expenditure for government is debt service and debt repayment, eight trillion. The next budget line is only two trillion. So we need to, we need to change this. Look at that chart there. It's a, it's a problem. So when you have a refinery that is working, then your revenues can come to your pocket and you don't have to spend money on subsidies. That is why we all supported the, uh, removal of subsidies so that government can balance its budgets and we can resolve the fiscal side of the issues. So that's my own. Like we say in Yoruba, TJ Abawa yeah. All right. Well, it looks like hopefully they're on their way to um, tying up the loose ends and solving the issues. We're still looking forward to what the outcome from that meeting with the Minister of State for Petroleum Oil would, would be. But let me ask around um, the fiscal side of things, yes. because you talked about that. And, uh, and yes, you talked about some interventions, the 150 um, duty-free window mm. for food importation for some categories of food. Yes. But as was said at the MPC yesterday, that in order for these, shall I say, gains or for um, these hikes in rates mm. to, you know, for it to have the much desired impact, then they have to work with the fiscal side of things. Yes. What are some of the things? Because we hear, we're hearing, and, and you know, you talked about the number of meetings that have been had in terms of the MPC. But how about the fiscal part? What are some of the things that ought to be done to complement? I don't know if when we talk about security and the impact on food production leading to infl um, food inflation, it almost seems like oh, leave that. Like we can't solve that anytime yet. I don't know if we should still bring that to the conversation. And other things that ought to be done, we can't keep raising rates. It's not just small businesses. Even Alaja Liko Dangote said that businesses, big businesses, cannot continue to thrive under a harsh a, 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 a business environment where you're borrowing at thirty percent or more and more. Do you understand? So it's not, yes, yeah, so I'm speaking up for the small businesses, but we can't continue to just say, oh, it's the rates. We increase the rates to, to tame inflation. How about the other things that ought to be happening side by side? Well, thank you for that. Those are what you call the structural reforms, which is to be handled by the government. Um, yes, uh, it's also of a significant amount of concern for me, and that's why I showed you that chart. So um, because we're, our debt levels are becoming, you know, if we're not careful, they're becoming unsustainable. Yeah. We still have the headroom, we can still service the debt, reserves are going up, but that does not mean that you do not control that. 
And what is the key issue? The key issue is that you are spending a lot of money is being wasted on subsidy. And that's why we supported the subsidy removal. Mm. But then we do not have, we've lacked the political will to be able to put, if we resolve petroleum pricing, government will bring in $10 billion a year into their coffers and this problem will be resolved. That's the silver bullet. It's very simple. You solve this subsidy problem and you let everybody but know. But at what cost to Nigerians? Though? Yeah, I think that's it, the reluctance see, of the We, we cannot continue government. to say at what cost to Nigerians. There are countries in Cameroon, Niger, and Benin that are poorer than Nigeria that pay market price for fuel. So if you continue to say that, then those countries will continue to get your fuel at cheap prices and they'll continue to take it across the border. That is where you have your problem. Cameroon is poorer than Nigeria. Niger is poorer than us. Benin is poorer than us. But if you go to their price... See what they're paying at their pump price. Is it? So we need to stop all this. Okay, but provide so infrastructure see, no, 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 you see and that, cut government yeah, yeah, excesses. Yeah, that's because what we're saying. If, yeah. You see, that's the optics, which is what a lot of people are talking about. Yes. Let us look at the numbers. Okay, if we say that government puts, saves 10 billion a year with, uh, with that, that means that the pump price will go to 1,000 naira at least. Okay, and that's the solution. It's a very simple solution. So when you have that, then the government now has to be accountable for that. Then you go and resolve your issues with Mr. Dangote. Okay? Because what now happens is that he will save you the cost of the landed cost because you don't have to import fuel from, from Europe anymore. So that's the only, that's the only advantage well, you're getting. Get you off, yeah. Okay? You're not getting the reduction on price, but you will get the savings from the cost of fuel. So reduce that. So if you reduce that burden, we, government has to have the will. So when the president made the announcement that he has removed subsidy of fuel and he now also did the foreign exchange thing, the net sum gain was zero because the foreign exchange uh, devaluation wiped out the subsidies that he said he removed. So he now has the, we need that courage to be able to get it done. Look, my own concern, if you take a look at the numbers now, the deficits for 2024 is what, 9.1 trillion. We have a revenue shortfall of 3.8 trillion, and we have a new supplementary budget of 6.3 trillion. Yeah. So now the total now is there's 19 trillion that needs to be fi financed. Okay, so now you can see the windfall tax on banks are coming. You know, and of that brings in about two trillion. Well, yes. Yeah, so, that but at least it, it will fund something. You know, and you, they are looking at other. And if you resolve the issues, and then we need to start looking at the oil and gas industry again, NNPC. All these JV arrangements we have, we should start selling them down. Sell down 10% of your JV. To raise capital? Yes, to raise capital. Okay, uh, let me you come You get in. about $10 billion for let, that. Let me come in here. So that is, we're getting to the stage whereby we need to make, do something let, let me come projects. in here. But you're getting that $10 billion from the sell down of JV. Mm. Some ungo-go-go-go-go uh, will still eat the money up, you see, with corruption. Uh, no, no, no. The truth is, we know that. You will still take some of those monies and give to the National Assembly members to buy SUVs for them. The president will still buy his private jet out of that. That's the optics people don't like. Mm. I'm going back to Cameroon. You're saying, yes, people should go ahead, increase fuel price. Yes. Remove subsidy totally. Yes. And people will have to go through another bout of attendant inflation. Do you want to compare the food inflation you have in places like Cameroon to what we're having here? Do you want to also compare the level of, you know, government injection in citizen life there to what we're having here. Obviously, let's not deceive ourselves. The parameters differ. I've gone to most of these African countries, Cote d'Ivoire and the likes. Yes, prices are high and all of that. But you want to compare with the nascent factors we have here at a point in time like this. I get your arguments. Once we pull that out, we'll be able to reinvest the money in other things. But we also live in this country where Nieti says in crude oil thefts, hundreds of billions of US dollars have been taken away. You see, this is the same country we, had, we, we talk about crude oil thefts. We talk about people that have blending plants in Malta. We talk about state grafts. And at the same time, we have a very small economy where the pie is not big enough. I'm happy you talked about the fact that Angus's revenue will ruin top government revenue. I'm talking about empirical facts on the table. This idea of we take the savings and reinvest. When President Tinubu announced that we're going to take the savings from the subsidy remover to reinvest, what has he done with it? Where are the CNG buses today? 
Okay. The, in this same country, NMPC took two billion dollars to build Port Harcourt refinery. It was mechanically completed in December. Till today, we've not seen any oil from the refinery. Okay, uh, Rufai, let me just answer something quickly. When I say that we should, you see, these things you don't do them. It's not shock therapy. I think you saw the Financial Times article. I think we already when they talk about will shock therapy save Nigeria. Um, so it's not shock therapy. You understand that you have a problem. And we need to deal with it over time. So the subsidy removals will be something that we need to start to take out gradually. Okay, phases. I'm, I'm, not, Good. I'm not saying that you look at it, but you know the savings are there. So you need to start doing it gradually, gradually Phase removal. Okay. over a period of time so that you can sustain that. Everything you've talked about becomes political. You see, but what I don't want to do is that I don't want to weaponize monetary policy and make it a political tool. Because when you do that, you tend to lose the sort of focus. I like to stick with the facts and figures. So it is up to people like you with your own advocacy and civil society to hold government to responsibility for that. I have my own campaign. You know, I'm a ways and means campaigner. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I've taken that as my own campaign and I'll continue but, to walk through the system on that. So, but, but it's what we need to understand is that the fundamentals are there. We cannot run away from the fundamentals. Interest rates, inflation, yeah. and all those things. And there's a cause and effect. So if you, if you have a 30 trillion ways and means party, you're going to have a hangover after that. Yeah. And you're going to have to deal with that hangover. And it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. But we're here when they weaponized and politicized monetary policy by some governors because they wanted to win election, stopped the Naira redesign policy, took the CBN to court, to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court made a pronouncement of monetary policy matters. After doing that, the problem has not gone away. The problem has not stopped into 100 trillion money in circulation today. So we were here when all of that happened. So we can't take politics out of our national life. They did it. We saw them. Where are they today? It's the problem persists. It's a political economy. Yeah, okay. but it's sad. Before, before we let you go, mm. can you please explain the implications of this uh, interest rate by the monetary policy to the ordinary people? I raised the question about small businesses. Mm. It's not even only small businesses. Organized private sector is yes. complaining. Yeah about how the cost of borrowing will go up, how credit lines will become more expensive in the context of the National Assembly just passing a new national minimum wage uh, law. Mm. So how will businesses survive? You say stagflation. Yes, that's theory to ordinary Nigerians who are watching us. Which, what it mean, does it mean that our lives will get worse. The hunger that all of us are experiencing will get worse. But not theory. Yes. Practical. Okay. okay. Well, let me explain it to you in a pure practical terms. Yes. Let, uh, in the way that ordinary man, people, we see, understand it. In ordinary order, man doesn't know stagflation. Exactly. Okay. We want to buy things and all of a sudden we cannot stretch our Naira now. One Naira that used to give us certain things. So one area that used to buy some bags of Gary for us cannot buy bags. I think I'm the advocate or the exponent. I'm the exponent of such an economy. Mm. We have become such an economy. Even alcohol is now being sold in such a in Nigeria. That is because we can no longer stretch our Naira. So for every one Naira we get, we can't buy as much Gary as we used to buy before. So what are we going to do to ensure that the one Naira we have can buy more Gary for us. If inflation continues to rise, one Naira can no longer buy more Gary for you. So the way we can reduce inflation to get your one Naira to buy more Gary for you is to increase interest rates on the short term. And please don't get me wrong. I told you that in 2011, so we've done it before. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's something that has happened in Nigeria before. It didn't happen in another country. Check it, 2011, 2014. Inflation was 9 to 11%. Interest rates was at the optimal rates of 11 to 13% you're talking about. So what we're saying is let's get back our economy to that period. If interest rate is so high, how do you deal with productivity? 
That is, productivity issues will come into play. But if you do not control inflation, your productivity will continue to not exist. And if we do not control inflation, do you know the direction we're going? We're going the direction of Zimbabwe and Venezuela. So that is the flip side of that. You now have hyperinflation because you do not want to face the reality of that. So I think it is important that we look at it because the economic management in this country today is very critical. And that's why I feel that this Dangote refinery issue is a distraction because the success of that project can actually help reduce inflation because it will make, there will be a margin, there will be at least in, uh, stabilized supply, energy security. So that is the reason why. The, the, the interest rate increase is a temporary phenomenon. Nobody wants interest rates of this percentage, but we're going to have to endure it for one year. And that's why you are saying that, you see, these social intervention programs that have failed is really where the sad part of it is. Because when you do these things, you understand you have a problem. So you give people breaks. You know, you get a tax break here, productivity you're talking about. That is when you begin to give industry the breaks they need to help them improve. That's why you do palliatives. But if you cannot do the palliatives when you are going through a reform program, then the social issues will overtake you. Where the palliatives get stolen at the end of the day anyway. And the Dangote that you talk about, they are looking for him in Gabon. If Nigeria doesn't want him, they say, oh, come and help us. Come to Macedonia and help us. Yeah. Is that not what the Bible says? Yeah. A prophet who has no honor in his own home will be honored abroad. Thank you very much, uh, Chilewa.